Good morning, St. Mark's. I'm Preston Morgan, one of the pastors way down here at Clear Lake United Methodist Church. I am honored to be with you this morning as I have been in awe of your congregation for years. Your compassion for your community and your congregation is a wonderfully powerful witness. I also appreciate your support of Reverend Chapman as uh, she's on vacation this week. And so that I can join you in this support, uh, I'm thrilled to share a brief time with you this morning as we look at one of the incomparable stories, the parables of Jesus Christ. In just a little bit, we'll be in Luke chapter 15, the first seven verses. If you'd like to open your Bibles ahead of time or turn in BibleGateway.com uh, to read along, but the words will be on the screen as well. Before we begin, though, I'd like to tell you a brief story about uh, myself and we, I have a little daughter named Abigail. When Abigail was, was a bit younger, maybe, maybe three years old, we were at a McDonald's that had one of those big play places. And, and Abigail went up in the play place. I knew about where she was in the play place, of course. I was standing right outside. Um, but after playing for a bit, she got lost. And, and she, she didn't know how to get down, how to get to the slides and get down or to go back down. And as you can probably tell, I'm, I'm a big dude. And, and as my daughter was in the play place and, and crying and asking for dad to come get her, I had this mental image of me crawling up the slide or going up the ladder in the, in the play place. And it, it wasn't gonna be a pretty sight, but, and I had this thought of how I was gonna have to coach her and army crawl down to the slide area and then, and then belly flop out. Uh, it, it probably wouldn't have been very graceful. Thankfully, another young boy found her and, and quickly and coached her onto the slide. And so she came down the slide and there I was with open arms, excited to greet her again. And she came up and, and she had a disappointed face. And she looked at me and she said, Daddy, you lost me. She was telling me how she felt. It was an honest moment and the moment was truly precious. It was all I could do uh, but to give her a big hug and to smile behind her back. Let's pray. Holy God, we give you thanks and praise for not only creating our stories but for winding them and weaving them into your own. Lord, as we explore the parable of the lost sheep today, may we see ourselves and our lives reflected in your story. Lord, speak to us. Help us to be who you've called us to be now and forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How many times do we, do we just wish that God would speak directly to us? You know, we have questions, questions like, God, what should I do next? Or God, which of these options should I take? Or God, why, why is this happening to me? God, what do you want me to do with the rest of my life? Or even in those moments where we just say, God, I, I need an answer and I need it real quickly. We just wish we had the word of God in our ear. And, and lots of Christians would say that we have the word of God. We have the Bible. And, and I do agree However, the Bible doesn't explicitly give step-by-step -step, uh, suggestions or answers for everything. It doesn't tell us, for example, what career path exactly a college student should take whenever they graduate in 2020. It doesn't necessarily say step-by-step -step when exactly you might meet the person that you could marry or, or, or even who that person is, is going to be. Wouldn't it be amazing if you walked through life and God put like a special colored halo over the person that would eventually be your spouse and you'd be like, oh yeah, th I figured it out. That's, this is not how it goes. Um, it doesn't exactly say how to navigate the intricacies of the last stages of our lives and all the decisions that happen there towards the end. Or, or, or if we just look at the pandemic specific, like the questions that we have because of this pandemic, uh, the Bible doesn't give us step-by-step -step answers about whether or not we should wear masks, uh, which I hope that you do, but it's not in the commandments like thou shalt wear a mask. 
Uh, it doesn't tell us if our, if our if, if parents should send their kids to the brick and mortar school this fall when school resumes or have them attend school online. And those are questions that I know parents are wrestling with at home. It, the Bible doesn't step by step explicitly tell us if churches should reopen. Should we open in July or August or September, October, November, December or 2021? And so one of the ways that God uses the word of God to speak to us in scripture is the one of the ways that God in scripture reminds us who we are and who God is and how we are in relationship with one another, us and God and one and one another uh, to you and me and, and the rest of the body, the rest of the community is to tell stories. Scripture is absolutely full of parables, of stories, and Jesus famously told parables all the time. Now, these, these stories that Jesus speaks about, these parables, they speak a truth that's, that's often very hard to hear. The Greek, para, uh, means alongside or together with, like parallel or paradox. And the Greek, balo, means to cast or to throw. And so Jesus gives stories to stand alongside our lived experience, our questions and our doubts. That's what these parables are doing. Let's compare this story and our story. Let's compare ourselves to the characters in these parables, in these stories. The parables invite us to ask ourselves often in difficult questions, but they invite us to ask ourselves, what would we do in those situations? And what would those characters do in our situations? Whether we, uh, it makes us wonder should we choose similarly to the characters in the parables or should we choose differently? Whatever it is, we hope because of these parables to choose what's most appropriate for us as believers, as followers of Christ and for the kingdom of God. The parables cut against the grain of our sinfulness, our selfishness, greed, and even our sense of self-preservation. Parables challenge us and they're so hard sometimes to hear. Your first reaction to a parable may very well be one of resistance, and that's okay. Scripture is challenging you to grow. Do your very best not to close yourself off in those moments because it does get uncomfortable. These parables are hard to hear, but as people, sharing stories is how we share life. Like uh, maybe think about when you sit by a fire or around a Thanksgiving table with those you love and you tell stories. You share your life stories, your favorite places and favorite experiences with one another. Parables are a way for Jesus to gather us around and to speak of our Christian identity and remind us of our sacrificial mission and hold us accountable to our heavenly purpose. Jesus also uses parables because perhaps... Uh, the stories grow with us. It's not just a fact that we have to figure out along the way of life, but it's a story that evolves and grows as we and our character and our own uh, faith evolves and grows. At different seasons in life, we may gain new perspective. We may see a parable differently than we did before, or maybe we see the characters in it in a new light and from a new vantage point. As we grow in our own faith, we discover the parables are like exploring the beach. You can walk along the beach, uh, and that turns into wading in the waves when you get a little more brave. And when you get a little more brave, wading in the waves turns into treading water and bobbing on the surface, kind of riding the waves up and down. And if you get more brave and you want to explore further, treading water turns into diving into unknown worlds. We ask ourselves again when we look at parables and we put them up against our own experiences, what would we do in those stories? And what should we do here in our own? Our first parable comes from Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. 
Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, both the, the Gospel of Luke and Matthew tell this same parable, the parable of the lost sheep or the parable of the wandering sheep, and they tell it differently. At least when they tell the parable is different from, from, from Luke to Matthew. Why are there two tellings? Like this is something that, uh, dr you know, drives me crazy sometimes. Why are there two different tellings of this experience? Like who got it wrong? Was it Matthew or was it Luke? And who got it right? Which one should I pay more attention to? Uh, and, and after a while, after reflecting on why, why across the Gospels, especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic Gospels, why, why are these stories often framed differently? Uh, it made me think of... When uh, you or I, you know, that, you know that uncle or sister or father or mother who tells the same story or quotes the same thing again and again. Think of your Thanksgiving table again or think of a time when you're with people uh, at a staff meeting or something and you, you hear the story about how uh, little Jimmy is afraid of pickled beets and why it's important to read food labels or why grandma's car only has one mirror now and it's not the one on the passenger side. By the way, both of those stories are true to the Morgan family. We have both of those stories that we tell over and over again over the years. Uh, or, or how children don't get lost in a play place, but instead parents lose them in a play place to make this uh, more directed at myself. Jesus probably spoke this parable about the wandering or lost sheep in many instances to try to remind people and to help them understand, um, help them understand better in multiple contexts. It's something that Jesus probably revisited over and over and over again because as you journey through scripture, you see that, that the disciples and the followers of Christ, they, they had trouble comprehending parables just like we do today. I don't, I don't usually jump between books of the Bible when we're having these conversations because it's easy to lose the context of what is said and when it's said and why it's said in that specific instance. But today, uh, you look really well rested. I tried to get a lot of sleep last night. I trust that today we're going to break the rule and we're going to bounce back and forth between Luke and Matthew because they actually seem to work together really, really well and they illuminate something for us if we put them side by side. Luke's telling of this parable is in a space with tax collectors and sinners who are gathering round and the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, uh, to put it differently, the religious and cultural authorities who are observing are calling Jesus out for keeping such terrible company, sinners and tax collectors. The parable ends there in Luke uh, with the image of, of great rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents uh, as com compared to 99 right righteous people uh, who don't need to repent. Jesus follows this parable there in Luke. Uh, he follows this parable with another about a lost coin and a third about a lost son. And I mean, Jesus is just on a roll here. He's trying to address the earlier conversation of the Pharisees and the tax collectors and with those, those uh, sinners. Uh, and and, and he's, he's telling them one example after another after another. Matthew, on the other hand, Matthew's telling this parable in a different way. The scene is one where the disciples of Jesus, uh, those who are following Jesus, they ask him, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus calls over a little child and says to the disciples, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. 
And then in that scene, Jesus warns them against causing little ones, that's the, the word in the scripture, uh, those, who, those who believe, little ones, those who believe, to stumble or to sin. And then Jesus says the parable of the lost or wandering sheep and concludes it this time with, in the same way your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. In the gospel according to Luke, it's about a sinner who repents. And in the gospel according to Matthew, it's about the salvation of these little ones, the children and those who change themselves to be childlike believers, uh, to answer the disciples' questions, the truly greatest in the kingdom of heaven. In Luke, the shepherd, and to quote scripture, loses one of the sheep. It, it echoes my daughter at McDonald's in the, you know, coming out of the playscape when she looked at me and she said, you lost me. In Matthew, the sheep, the Greek word is planao, or they wander off, or to translate the same Greek word a little differently, planao, they are deceived. Again, talking about children, and in this case, being led astray. Maybe it's free will, uh, broadly speaking, or maybe, maybe the sheep in the story are lured away from the flock. In both cases, Luke and in Matthew, um, maybe it's the actions on the part of the sheep that result in being lost, maybe not. Maybe we're to view ourselves on the part of the sheep or as the sheep, and maybe we're to see ourselves as the shepherd, uh, and, and the passage is calling us out for our own shortcomings and our lack of attentiveness to what really matters. And to take that even a little further, and then the passage uh, is giving us uh, the expectation to pursue what or even who we forget or, or lose or fail to keep beside us. In both cases, in Luke and in Matthew, the shepherd has the wherewithal to realize that a tiny fraction of the 100 is missing, to see that one out of a hundred is not with the group is quite a task. I was trying to imagine what it would be like to be a shepherd with an actual flock of sheep. I think that if I had three sheep, definitely no problem. I wouldn't lose a single one. If I had 12 sheep, and I hope, I want you to do this with me. If you had 12 sheep, sure, we could keep 12 sheep uh, between the two of us. If you had 25 sheep, uh, and it's a long day and the heat's beating down. You know, you got sweat on your brow. You're squinting a lot. Uh, you, you might want to keep your eyes open and be counting quite quickly because they move around. But if you had a hundred sheep, would you realize that one is missing? That's impressive. In both cases, in Luke and in Matthew, it's the children, the sinners, and those aren't the same thing. It's the children and the sinners and the tax collectors, or those who are despised and rejected, uh, the tax collectors could mean those who have a different allegiance than we do, who are to be sought out, uh, even at a risk to ourselves. These children, these sinners, these tax collectors, these are the people who, who should be supported over our shoulders when they're found, and when they're brought back to the community, lifted up and celebrated. Whose fault it is uh, about getting lost, uh, it may not be the most important point, uh, but the attentiveness to see who's missing. And as resident sinners, you and me and all of us, the, the presence of mind to embody the change in our hearts, to rejoin the community, that's key. Now, as parables do, there isn't just one understanding to be found from the lost or wandering or deceived sheep, uh, or if you want to call it the forgetful or daring or party hardy shepherd. Uh, but I want to encourage you to take a moment today and sit with this story. Place it, as we do with parables, up against your own. Where is it coming alongside what you're going through in life? What or who in your life has been forgotten or wandered off? Are you daring enough to seek them out, to put them over your shoulders and support them and to bring them back? And of course, to celebrate them, even if they have different allegiances than we do. What has deceived you? This might be a question to pivot slightly um, as you reflect on this. What has deceived you 
away from the kingdom of heaven? What might have caused you to wander? Or have you deceived yourself away from where God wants you to be today and in this season? Are you willing to be found? And are you willing to be celebrated as a child of God? Again, take a moment today, sometime uh, after this afternoon, this evening, or, or, or it may be in your evening prayer before you go to bed, and sit with this story, with this parable. This week, when you're in the mission field, when you're out and you're doing your thing, or you're at home and you're doing your thing, uh, you're either lost or you're seeking those who are. Go and find someone or make a change within yourself and be found. And when you're all done, celebrate.